represent Bremen in the second chamber of our parliament, which is the Bundesrat, the re <coughs> parliament of the German regions, you will know. And there I've been a member in the Committee for European Affairs. And from there, 1995, I went to Brussels to the European Commission, to the DG Employment. I've been working there for six years, and then 2000, I've been asked to take over the head of the representation of Bremen in Brussels. And if I summarize my career, I, I think I have two privileges. One is that I had a focus on European affairs from all the important sectors, both from uh, the regional perspective from Bremen, I had to deal with European affairs, then from the parliamentarian side in the Bundesrat, then from the Commission, and now as a well, head of representation. In a way, it's a lobby institution. I don't like this word too much, but in a way we are. So I had all the various views um, on the European policy, and that I think is, is quite, uh, makes, gives, gives me a rich impression and knowledge about European affairs. And the second privilege is that I can combine in my job two passions in my life, which I'm a real European and I'm really Bremen minded. And so representing Bremen in Brussels to, to the European institutions, it's really combining two parts of my identity in a way. And that, um, and at the end, uh, it makes me feel never, never, never that I've, that I've been bored uh, by my job. Never. I have never the feeling that I have a boring life or a boring job, which is really uh, to be considered is quite a privilege. Um, okay, so you have the various perspectives here from um, the five of us. And I would like to start a first round of discussion with the following. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I would first like to say thank you for all the insights that you and, uh, and sharing your uh, careers and so on. But I do um, have one question because my, my, I am a non-EU citizen and most of us from the Flans <coughs> University of Flensburg in studies are, are non-EU citizens. And so my question is to you is how can someone who is not an, uh, who is an, a non-EU citizen get his foot into the EU studies field or in Brussels and get the upper hand. Uh, and I guess this question is more to the lovely young gentleman with the maroon vest, since you are not EU <laughs> citizen. Uh, maybe you could, uh, is it more just about luck? Is it about um, um, planning and strategy? How could someone get into Brussels who is a non-EU citizen and get the upper hand, so to say? Thank you very much. <laughs> This, this is going to come back and bite me, just like my, my comment about Bonn. Um, uh, now then. Uh, when, when I first arrived in Germany, um, I went to the Einkorn Meldamt, which probably you had to go to too, and, and register as a, as a sort of incomer. Um, and they had my passport for something like seven months, and they said, we're, we're doing a bit of research on you, you can have it back soon, just doing a bit of research. And at the end they said, you're very welcome to stay, you're an EU citizen. And I thought, I'm not sure I'm going to correct this, and I'm sure we can keep this amongst ourselves. Um, I, I've been there ever since. When I arrived in Brussels, I, I had to go and knock on people's doors and say, you know, here, here we are, and we've opened the office. Um, and one of the people's doors that I knocked on, um, was an Englishman called Jonathan Fall who was running um, the Justice and Home Affairs Director General. And I went in with a sort of pile of, of publications from my think tank and my passport on the top, because I had thrown the show at the door downstairs. Um, uh, and I was chatting away, and eventually he just said, Look, shut up and give me your passport. You shouldn't have this. Um, and it turned out that the Isle of Man had sort of unilaterally opted in to the common EU passport format without really telling anybody, um, which explains why the Germans thought that I was an EU citizen um, and explains the political trouble that then followed my visit to Jonathan Ford. Um, so, in that case, pure luck um, uh, and a bit of trickery on the part of my island, which, as I say, we we'll keep amongst ourselves. Um, uh, there are, I think, ways, there are foreign 
organizations uh, in Brussels and previous interns of mine are working uh, at the US mission, um, etc. So, so that is possible. Also, the international organizations that are there, the UN organizations that are there, um, are, are open to these things. Um, beyond that, it is very tricky though, I think. Um, uh, and the only thing I can suggest is if you, funny enough, you know, you're studying EU studies, but rather like me having studied French and so on, my employer suddenly looks at me and says, oh, you know, you're, you're good about telling us about Britain. Remember to keep up to speed about what's happening in, in your home countries, because that's invaluable to the people in Brussels who know all about the EU and know nothing about the rest of the world. And you, purely by dint of your nationality, um, uh, can provide that knowledge. So I think, I, I think that's the best way, um, or cheap, like me. <laughs> I, yes, but, but let me please try to organize uh, the discussion in a way, and I think we will exactly meet your point. Because my first round would be to ask um, ourselves, imagine that we are employers. I mean, maybe we are in a way, we employ people, we have posts from time to time, or if not, we can imagine what we would do if we would be employers. Imagine we are employers. Imagine we have a post to fill. What kind of criteria would we consider most to be most important? What would we look for? And maybe you can touch the points. Do we expect Brussels experience? Do we expect knowledge in a certain discipline? Or do we expect broad knowledge about European politics? Do we expect studies, European or others? Do we look for soft skills? And if so, which would be the soft skills? How, where do we, where do we meet our candidates? Do we wait for written applications? Or how important is it to meet someone, as you did with, with uh, Jonathan, by accident? Or do we meet people during, represent, uh, during events in Brussels? So, looking from their perspective, answering these questions, we have a post, or two, or three. How do we proceed? What do we look for? What is important for us as criteria? Who would like to start? Omi? Yes, if you allow me. So I have a quick, not a lot, but some persons. First, uh, in our delegation of the French Chamber, and now in the European Economic and Social Committee, I'm now fortunate to be president of one of the three groups. So I'm recruiting panel for our institution, for temporary posts, or permanent posts, or for our secretariat, we are main, mainly temporary posts. I would say that for me, and I, you understand my passion, the first point, first question would say, why are you going to Brussels? Why do you want to work for, for, for the European Union? You can be someone from a non-EU country, but, but be, be interested in the European project. What I don't want, I don't want any people with, I would say, technocrats uh, who are thinking, who are just thinking of his career. This will be my first. Second point is the languages. Uh, personally, I learned Polish, I learned German, I learned some other languages. And I think that uh, it's so important to understand the culture of the others. It's so important to understand the Europeans. And for that, there's no other way than to learn the languages. Uh, and a little sad that everything is doing in English, uh, including include here. Uh, and, I know that, and I know that the English people, I know a lot, they are sad too, because they, they have to suffer such, such bad such by English speakers everywhere. So it's, it's a little sad, but I think it's, uh, for me it was the key to learn German. Uh, I would say that the German-French reconciliation was so important for me because it was the way to get rid with the wars, to get rid with the atrocities of the world. So language skill is very expensive. I will say third, another thing very important for me is that it's an experience in the real life. Uh, I think it's so important. It's, we have so many people, unfortunately, in Brussels today, 
uh, in the European Union administration who have no idea what is the real life. They are quite high wages. They live, uh, they live in a sort of bubble and they don't have any ideas what, is, what, the, the, what the average European cit citizen is doing. It's probably why they are sometimes lacking of any uh, common sense. So my Twitter will be someone who has, I would not say has suffered, but has really uh, uh, lived as a normal person. Yeah. Not, uh, not a son, uh, and nothing against my, my son is doing the European affairs too, but uh, I think I'm a privileged person who has, who has an experience. And last point, but this was already mentioned by, uh, by Professor Pauline. It's, uh, I would say, uh, we say in French, le sens critique. Uh, I, I think I will, need, I will need someone who will consider the European affairs uh, with his own, his personal view. Someone with his, who has his, his personal idea on everything and not just repeating like a parrot, I would say the, the common language, we say in front de la langue de bois, uh, and speak the European technocratic language. This will be my, my four. My four criteria: the passion, the language, the experience of the real life, and the Sanskrit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rahul, do you share? Absolutely. Or do you, have, do you have different aspects to consider? No, absolutely. I could not have said it better. I just wanted to add one thing yeah. regarding the non-EU citizens. You know that there is the intern program of the European Commission. And also non-EU citizens can participate. There is a certain quota for non-EU member states. So I would also really encourage you to do that. And when we could also, in our unit, I mean, we have not really the choice. We get, get pre-selected candidates. But what we are looking for are people that have a European studies background, if possible. Motivation, when, when we invite them, and languages. So, yeah. mm -hmm. coincides with you, sir. I would just add, so, sorry, but if maybe I, I get a new position in some months in my institution, I will probably work with someone, a non-European non Union citizen. And I think it didn't matter. Matters, guy from, uh, young guy from Belarusia. Uh, important is the passion and all these talents, not uh, citizenship. Yeah. Okay. 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 Could you use the micro, please? <coughs> ah, well, use it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Then you see that all that there it's specifically said, so I would complain against it. Well, this is like, can I try and answer? Uh, I don't know where you're from, but I was in the internship program recently. And does it work? Yeah. <laughs> and and when they did the hands up, there were people from everywhere. Colombia, uh, US, Belarus. So it's and there was a lot of them. European Commission, uh, 650 students each semester, a big bunch of those are from outside the EU. We have currently a Russian interviewer and two, and two Turkish, so I really don't know, it's, it's strange. Uh, depending on where uh, you come from, for example, if you come from Turkey or Macedonia. No, I'm from Russia. Russia. Yeah. Well, okay. My colleague is a good example. Uh, if you apply for DGM Larger, you're not allowed to be uh, one of the candidate countries. Uh, as a Brazilian myself, I did the internship program in, uh, in this quota of non-EU citizens, uh, and it worked out uh, very, very fine. The thing that I found out that the density of applicants for those uh, non, for 15% is lower than the density of applications for the other uh, 85. For example, if you are Italian and, uh, and Chinese, maybe applying as a Chinese, gives you a better chance of getting it as, as applying to the data. Do you agree that we should give the opportunity to the others to respond to our question? Because I, I really would, would appreciate if we would have some more ideas about criteria. And maybe you can answer to that um, specialized question.
for the application <coughs> or sales could or end, so maybe you have an answer to that. Thank you. Okay, um, I am and I have been an employer and uh, uh, European studies graduates uh, come to me sometimes to, to ask for work. I have uh, five criteria that I look at. Um, so each of them I give about 20% weighting to. Now, um, I'm very sorry to, uh, to the university and to the other universities, but education is just one of my criteria. So even if you have a wonderful degree from, uh, or lots of wonderful degrees in all sorts of things European, I'm only going to score up to 20% for it. Um, it's important. You need an, an understanding, you need the background. But as well as that, you need some other things. Um, so as well as education, I would put in their experience. So it could be experience in a European Union environment, or it could be an experience in something completely different. Um, some, uh, somebody I was interviewing uh, a few years ago um, for uh, a European policy officer job, um, he'd not worked at all in the EU, but after studying in England, uh, he went to the Czech Republic and uh, worked as a volunteer there. And uh, it just so happened that we were preparing um, a region-to-region -region cooperation agreement with, uh, an with a region in the Czech Republic, and we wanted somebody who knew a bit about the country. He got the job. Uh, he, he only spoke about 10 words of Czech, but he got the job because it was, it was important he had that experience. So that's the second thing. And the, the third thing is skill. And what we mentioned, uh, linguistic skills. Now, that is really, really important. Um, I only speak about 10 words of Latvian. And I've used about 8 of them already, speaking to uh, one of my colleagues. But that's 10 words more than the vast majority of people in England. So they think I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to have some skill. It doesn't matter if it's a low skill or if it's a high skill. If you've got some skill, it's on your CV and you can use it to your uh, benefit. Uh, the fourth thing is attitude. And I think this is really, really important. If, if somebody comes to me and they, they think, well, oh, he really should give me a job. I deserve it. Then I'm going to see that in, in the first 10 seconds of interviewing them. Um, nobody's going to give you anything. But if people, if people see that you've got uh, passion about something, they're going to say, well, if he's got passion about this, he'll have passion about his job. And it'll work for him. And the final thing, it is really, really difficult to, to measure this, but I would say it's common sense. There's so many opportunities for people to do silly things for no reason at all, which show that they have no common sense. And I don't want somebody like that working for me. If you've got common sense, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can show that in, a, in so many different ways. Um, if, you, if you come to the door and it's locked, what do you do? Do you go away or do you ring the bell? No, it's common sense and you've got to show that. Uh, uh, so those, those are the five things. Um, one final point about um, non-EU citizens. Um, Brussels is an amazing place to be if you are a non-EU citizen. Um, obviously all the countries have uh, permanent representations uh, uh, many, many regions of countries, like Bremen, uh, have their regional offices. Um, but lots of non-EU countries have uh, representative offices as well, which act as a sort of embassy passing back uh, information and intelligence to, to their home countries. Um, it's, they are always looking for people uh, uh, as well, and it doesn't matter necessarily if you're not a, a, a national of that particular country. And I know that there's one country that is not in the EU, it's not in the UK, 
but it has, in the last year, opened an office in Brussels, and that's the Isle of Man. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to add some, some elements from, from my perspective to those criteria the colleagues uh, on the panel already mentioned. Um, I sometimes use the word that Brussels is a jungle, um, and in a way it is. And from there I define our role as regional um, people there as pathfinders. Pathfinders which um, are able to find their way in the jungle. And for this you need at least some things. One is you have to be curious. You never should be satisfied. You have to be curious about everything which happens in, say, in the sector you're working in. I should add even more. I think European politics are so interesting, fascinating, that you shouldn't, should never focus on, on a certain sector. But um, looking at Europe as a complex and fascinating system. So curiosity is, is an important thing. The second thing is, when I um, have people who apply for a post, I, I always look um, whether they are flexible enough for this going around in the jungle. In a way, it's the opposite as what we call in German a Beamter, a functioner in the public sector. You have to be really flexible, you have to be, um, you have to have courage. You have to go to people, you have to talk to them, you have to ask for their opinion, you have to go to the commission and to find the right partner to speak to if you want to say, you have to go to the parliamentarians or to their assistants if you want to get things through. And therefore you need a certain courage, self-confidence, courage. Um, and a third thing which seems to be very important, at least from, from the perspective of an external institution like we are, maybe not so much in, in the system of European Commission or Parliament, but we have to network. You mentioned the Bremen office. Of course, Bremen is very important in Brussels and has a very important office. However, we are very small, so with 10 people. And we are one of depending on how you count it, one of 2,400, 2,500 um, similar offices and representations who more or less exactly want the same as we want, making um, promotion for our interests. And if you want to do that successfully, normally it's never enough to do that alone. So you have to network. Networking means you have to find partners. And networking starts in our mind. So if I get someone from Bremen administration or from somewhere else who is applying for a post, I try to find out whether he or she is able to think in complex systems. Because only someone who is able to think, to think in complex systems is able to work in complex structures and systems. So that would be another criteria. All the other things which have been mentioned, um, I agree to. Roderick. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder why he wants to go before me, but that's so you could agree with everybody else and then leave it open as to whether you agree with Very sensible. Um, uh, there are three things. EU knowledge, uh, getting to know people and soft skills. EU knowledge, um, when I was in Berlin, EU knowledge was the most important thing. What, what we were doing for the most part was trying to translate what was happening in, in, in Brussels into German policy making. Um, uh, so obviously understanding how the EU works is incredibly important. A lot of people take the path that I took, which is to come from a national capital, or from Bremen, or wherever, in, into Brussels that way. Uh, and that's not a bad place to start. Um, and that's why your EU knowledge would be most important. If you start in Brussels itself, then as I say, you'll find that everybody has EU knowledge. You have to have EU knowledge. So what's interesting to people is, um, 
either having something rather specific and unusual and practical. Um, I, I work with someone with a, with a um, uh, technological degree, um, and that's uh, interesting to us because he combines EU knowledge with this very practical knowledge. Um, equally, um, if you know about one area of EU studies where there's always a demand for, that's interesting to people in Brussels as well. I think students are often looking for the niche topic, and I get hundreds of applications from people who know all about cybercrime um, or Syria or whatever's topical. Actually, what we want is, is what the Germans would call sort of dour team and topics that are always um, on, on the uh, uh, political agenda like agricultural policy or cohesion policy or lots of things that aren't necessarily terribly actual or terribly exciting but there's always a demand for them um, and that just sort of speaks to you of someone um, who is going to work their way into something that's perhaps not the most sort of sexy topic but is, you know, is at least a sensible person. So that, that EU knowledge. Um, the question of um, uh, whether I want somebody whose face I know, I think most people would probably say that they would be keen on having somebody that they can at least make a connection to, that they say, aha, I, I have met you before, or whatever it may be. Um, I would advise you when you're writing your master's thesis, or have you already done that? Yeah. All right. Well, for those who haven't, um, for God's sake, go to interviews in Brussels. Um, I was always told when, when doing my master's thesis, this is probably something that you're going to work on. Um, you know, have it in mind. Don't, don't necessarily do, um, do, do the topic that, that sort of grabs your, your passion most, but think a little bit further and think, you know, this is something that I, I can earn money with, so I'll, you know, I, I want a job in this direction. Go out, meet people, interview them. Even if you don't actually want their knowledge, the very fact of sitting in a room with them for half an hour or an hour it'll sort of go into their head and then you can keep an eye on their website and, and apply for a job. Um, uh, most people I know who have come via that path into Brussels or, or sort of found their first job in Brussels um, rather than starting out in the capital have done it through that sort of path of, of thinking cleverly about their master's thesis topic, going and knocking on the right doors. Um, soft skills. I'm going to disagree with everybody on the panel when they say they want passionate people. I don't want passionate people. Um, but I think that may be specific to think tank work, um, where um, you need people who have no beliefs or passions. Um, I need people who are good at thinking their way into a problem and don't come in um, with um, prefabricated ideas um, and lecture me about why it's going to be good for Europe. Um, that turns me off, that turns policy makers off as well, I think, if they're listening to, to young people saying, this is good for Europe, and you're sitting on you know, your desk in the commission, you think, I don't give a damn, I, you know, I just want to finish this before lunchtime, I don't really care what's good for Europe. Um, so, I think maybe specifically in, in my area, please, no passion, no beliefs. What we need is, I don't know if you've seen the films of the, the, what's it called, the, the talented Mr. Ripley or something. Um, imagine him without, without the murdering. Um, that, that's the sort of person you need, someone who can just sort of think their way into different situations and they have the necessary empathy to think, what does the person I'm working for need from me? What kind of ideas, what kind of analysis? And at the end, to, to give up ownership of the idea that they've had, um, because there's nothing worse than a think tanker who still keeps <coughs> claiming his idea, even after he's presented it. What you have to be able to do is go to politicians and say, this is my idea, and, and now you can have it, um, you know, and that's it, that's the end of my role. So you, you have to be able to sort of lose your, your ego. Um, and the very last thing on, on languages, um, I think there are some English people here. The first thing I had to do uh, was <coughs> learn English as a foreign language. Um, so for God's sake, if there are English people, don't